Obviously, we've just heard President Trump talk, uh, give his address to the World Economic Forum this morning, talk heavily about the uh, US economy and the performance of the US economy in the last few years, obviously, in particular. As a reminder, it's the 50th anniversary of the death of George Orwell today, and um, I was... Uh, one, of, one of George Orwell's great quotes was, uh, if liberty means anything at all, it's the freedom to say things that people don't want to hear. And I think President Trump was probably exercising <laughs> that, uh, that liberty uh, before an audience that hasn't always necessarily appreciated what he's had to say. Um, we have a great panel, so we have a great topic to discuss, which is the relatively strong performance, outperformance of the US economy uh, over a period of time now, but over the last decade or so since the financial crisis. The US has obviously grown at a somewhat faster rate than the other major developed economies. Um, Secretary Mnuchin, who obviously is with us, will probably want to talk about the particular outperformance and the slight acceleration in the last few years. But we're here to discuss that, what's led to that, how that's come about, and also about the durability of the, the US expansion. It's been almost 11 years old now. It's the longest expansion in the history uh, of the US economy. Um, and we want to examine the risks to the US expansion, what may derail it, uh, what we can expect over the coming year or so. And to do that, we do have a very distinguished panel. I'll very quickly introduce them. Uh, Glenn Youngkin is the co-CEO of uh, Carlyle, uh, the Carlyle Group. Gita Gopanath, the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund. Secretary Steve Mnuchin, you know, the U.S. Secretary, Treasury of the, Sec US, uh, Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. And um, Jim Fittling, CEO of Dow USA. I'm going to start, if I may, with you, Secretary Mnuchin. The President did say uh, in his remarks this morning um, that uh, this was a boom, an economic boom, that the United States was enjoying, the likes of which the world has never seen before. Now, we're going to get into some of the specifics of US performance in the last few years, and there's no question that it has outperformed the rest of the world, and on some measures, there have been some particularly impressive advances. But is it really the likes of which the, the kind of boom, the average rate of growth over the last few years has been about 2.5%. Under the Obama administration, it was about 2.2%, 2.3%. Um, in the 1950s, the U.S. grew at 6 percent, in the 80s at 4 percent, in the 90s at 3 percent. Are we really seeing the kind of spectacular boom that the president was talking about? Well, I think we are. And I think you, first of all, you have to look at this on a relative basis, not just an absolute basis. So there's no question the U.S. economy is outperforming the rest of the world. There's been a significant slowdown in the rest of the world. And we, we've had a significant increase since the Obama economy, creating an abundance, mil millions of new jobs, created a very significant increase in, in wages while we're growing GDP. And there's no question this is a result of the president's economic program, which we designed during the campaign of tax cuts, regulatory relief, and trade. And I think particularly this year, now we've had a very big week, in both signing the Phase One China deal and passing the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, I, I think these will be very important to the U.S. economy for the balance of this year. Do you think that the? I mean, obviously, the, there was a big lift in mm. boosting growth, almost three percent, two point nine percent of growth in 2018. That did seem to be a direct response to the tr heavy fiscal impulse that came from the big tax cuts uh, passed at the end of 2017. That does seem to have passed, and growth seems to be sort of slipping back in 2019. Uh, estimates around two, two and a quarter percent, maybe this year around two percent. Did we just get a one-off boost from that huge fiscal impulse, or is Ab this lost? Absolutely not. So, I mean, I, you know, I would say 2019 uh, again did well on an absolute basis. Was definitely slowed down from one, the world economy slowing down. So there's no question that China and Europe slowed down pretty dramatically. Also, we had the beginning of the impact of Boeing, the 737 MAX, and we had the GM strike. So there's no question all those issues, you know, probably cut about 50 to 70 basis points off of growth last year. And uh, I know we'll hear projections from the IMF and others, but we, we think people's projections are too low this year for 2020. Gita, um, let me ask you, do you share the view that the US, U.S.'s economic performance uh, has been fundamentally transformed? I mean, I think I would agree that, relatively speaking, if you look at advanced economies, the U.S. has been uh, doing quite well. It, is, it has many strengths to it. The unemployment rate is a, at a 50-year low. Uh, it has very flexible labor markets, so it's certainly doing uh, extremely well. But if you want to put a number on what the growth rate is going to be, uh, we have it at 2% for 2020, and we think of it tending towards about one three-quarter of a percent. I mean, if you remember, 2018, it was 2.9%. 2019, 2.3%, 2.2%. Uh, and an important part from our perspective, 
was the fiscal stimulus that was, was put in the system. Uh, you know, our projection for where we think the US is heading is driven mm -hmm. by our projection for where we where are for, for demographics uh, and for productivity growth. Now, of course, those are not, you know, at least productivity growth is not set in stone and that can be increased. But uh, right now, that's, those, are not, those are the numbers that we're looking at. Jim Fiddling, if I could turn to you, one of the things that a lot of people have said has perhaps been restraining growth, as good as it has been, relatively good as it has been in the last year or two, is concern about trade, concern about the global trading environment, particularly obviously the dispute with China. That is at least for now temporarily resolved. Phase one is done and the US got a lot of concessions, at least uh, you know, commitments to concessions from China. Is that reasons for perhaps uh, additional optimism about the U.S. economy in 2020 and beyond? Well, I think so. I think some certainty has come back into the marketplace. And if you look at December of 2018, we saw a slowdown globally in the industrial sector that lasted through 2019. I think mid-2019, everybody was worried about the term recession and people were starting to talk recession. But really, the consumer economy was good. The industrial economy had slowed. And there wasn't a lot of investment. So our own PMI and China's PMI had all, all come down. Now that there's some certainty back in the trade relationship with the US and China, I think you'll see people have a little bit more confidence to invest. It'll take a little time probably for that to kick in. But I would say that that would bring uh, investment back up. And those are big demand sectors. So automobiles, uh, the aerospace industry, infrastructure, steel, um, we need those. We need those kicking. Uh, yeah. Glenn, if I may, J J Jim raises um, a number of sectors there and a number of uh, areas of economic activity which, where there has been some weakness. And one of the most striking weaknesses for the US over the last couple of years has been in capital spending. Yes. Uh, much of the growth that we've seen has come from a very strong consumer. Now, we had these big tax cuts uh, in 20, at the end of 2017 which meant, meant a large proportion of which went to a significant corporate tax reform in the form of large corporate tax cuts. We haven't seen um, any significant, in fact, we've seen a dramatic slowdown in capital spending. Again, how important is the trade picture there and how might, what are the other reasons for that and how might that change? Well, there's, there's two, two topics here. The first is just a fundamental evolution of business. And so, we, over the last really 20 years, we've seen business evolve to a much more asset light um, structure. I mean, the reality is out of the top 10 companies in the Dow, only two of them fully spend their cash flow. The rest of them accumulate it. So overall capital spending relative to cash flow has declined just as, as business has evolved. And then second of all, and I think it just fits with the decline in trade, which was a global phenomenon. Remember, the, the, the trade dispute between the United States and China actually spread around the world. And in fact, it impacted Germany and Japan and South Korea and, and Singapore much more um, abruptly than it did the United States. And so while we've seen manufacturing uh, and industrial output really ebb around the world, Capital spending has declined there as well. So I agree. I think we've got a chance here with a real thawing of relationships with China, and in fact, hopefully on a positive note, to see positive sentiment pick back up ambition and aspirations in the boardroom, and hopefully we'll see spending pick back up. Secretary Mnuchin, has, has U.S. growth over the last year or two been held back by concerns about global trade? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I think, again, it's clearly been held back by a slowdown uh, around the world. We could debate to what extent I think that slowdown was not created by our trade issues. I think that slowdown was well, well in advance of trade. But there's no question there was a slowdown, and a, a global slowdown ha has an impact on global trade. The President once again mentioned today in his remarks that, uh, in his view, at least growth would have been stronger if the Federal Reserve had been more accommodating, had uh, not raised rates and, uh, so quickly and had cut them more quickly. Do you agree with that? Well, I, th I think you know in my role of Secretary of Treasury, I'm, I'm careful about commenting on it seems Fed policy. That, it seems a bit possible that your boss can criticize the Fed, but you, you, but you choose not to. Is that... Uh... Uh, absolutely. He's the President. I'm Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we can expect. So, but on, so, so even though you don't think trade has played a role, presumably you think that the the phase one trade deal you've got, the USMCA that you've got earlier, you did a, a US South Korea renegotiation. You think all of those will actually help to lift growth? Uh, that's right. And, and again, you know, when we talk about growth, GDP is one measure of growth. And, and again, the way GDP is calculated, there's a bunch of things that impact GDP. 
that are one-time events. So I'm not particularly focused on kind of whether GDP was higher or whether GDP was lower. What, what I'm focused on is what did it do to employment? What did it do to labor force participation? What did it do to wages? What did it do to consumer spending? And what, what is the forecast going forward? I think there's no question when we look at the forecast for 2020, uh, business in the U.S. feels very good. And there's no question that now the two trade deals we've done have, will have an impact this year. Uh, I would say on the other side, again, depending on how long it takes for the, the 737 MAX to get back into production, that's going to have an impact on headline GDP. I've already said publicly that could be 50 basis points uh, in, in GDP. But again, I wouldn't focus too much on the GDP number. We could have easily hit 3% if the facts had been slightly different. Uh, Gita, that, that's, a, that's an important point. Um, whatever the GDP numbers, there have been some very strong, as we said at the beginning, some, some very strong and quite unusually strong uh, performance by the US economy. Lowest unemployment rate uh, in 50 years now, um, well below 4%. At the same time, inflation essentially quiescent, no sign of inflation. Very significant real wage gains for not only for not only median wage gains, but they do seem to be sort of skewed, concentrated towards lower lower paid workers. So this phenomenon, this obvious phenomenon of income inequality that we've seen has been uh, addressed somewhat. Can you, do you think these are re fundamental changes, again, that's got, irrespective of what the, the overall trend rate of growth may be, we are seeing perhaps a, a rather different distribution of the, uh, of the yield of the fruits of economic growth that we've seen in the past? I think there is certainly uh, good news uh, on the, that the recovery came along with uh, <coughs> increasing wages at the low end of the distribution. Uh, but that said, I think it's important to point out that the US is, uh, in terms of inequality, income inequality and wealth inequality, is one of the highest among advanced economies. Uh, and it was not always that way. Uh, if you look at intergenerational mobility, which is whether your kid will have a higher income than you do, those probabilities have come down because there's been unequal access to education and to, to healthcare. So I'm just gonna put out there that I think more, need, more needs to be done on that front. We're talking about the US economy and resilience. We're talking about raising productivity growth in the US that would require a more, you know, greater education, a better outcomes on that front, uh, and more needs, more needs to be done there. And if I may, I, just, I would also say that the US tax system could be uh, uh, some more progressive. Uh, there are some low-hanging fruit uh, you know, there are some very wealthy individuals who can redefine uh, labor income as capital income. This is the carried interest uh, provision that's there in the income tax system. I think that needs to be got rid of. It, it's just, uh, you know, not, not right with, uh, for the times. Uh, and similarly, with, when it comes to estate taxes, there is a windfall to beneficiaries of wealthy individuals. Uh, so these are kinds of low-hanging fruit that I think uh, need to be addressed so that going forward, uh, there is more opportunity spread around, not just across people, but including across regions. So because if you look at the unemployment rate, it's three and a half percent for the country as a whole. But if you look at the unemployment rate in, say, New Mexico or in Mississippi, they are significantly higher. And those are lagging regions that continue to fall behind. And I think for the U.S. resilience, it's very important to bring those regions back up. Glenn, before we get on to the issues yeah. of resilience, can we just explore a little bit what, again, we all agree here and the numbers are mm -hmm. uh, unarguable, the U.S. has, has enjoyed stronger growth uh, over the last decade than, indeed, longer than that, but certainly let's focus since the financial crisis, uh, over the last 10 years than Europe and obviously Japan, you know, at least 50% higher than European growth rates and twice, twice Japan's. What are the different factors that are responsible, for, I mean, between demographics, between structural issues, between policy? What, 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 in your view, are the key reasons why the U.S. is though historically maybe growing slower than it has, is certainly outperforming the rest of the, the rest of yeah, the world. Yeah, I, I have to say, if we were all here exactly 10 years ago, and we took a poll of hands and said, how many people think that the United States is going to be a larger share of GDP in 10 years? Raise your hand. I, very few would have, would have raised their hand. And yet today, 10 years on, the United States is 25% of GDP when it was just 23% 10 years ago. Why is that? Right? Well, we tend to see four things uh, brought to bear that continue to make us extremely confident investing in the United States. First is the labor markets. Um, incredibly skilled, robust, flexible labor markets. Um, with now, one of the challenges is finding labor. And I think that's one of, gonna, one of the things we're gonna have to address over the next 10 years is we really do nearly have full employment. The second is the robustness of the capital markets. 
I mean, nearly 50% of the equity capitalization of the world is on U.S. exchanges. There's great formation of capital, and as a result, when businesses want to grow and seek capital, they can find it readily available. Third is the rule of law, and I think at the core, we have a great judicial system, and we understand contracts matter, and we can rely on that. And I think finally is a culture of innovation. I mean, the U.S. leads the world in R&D spending and patent filing, and well, we do, in fact, have a wonderful bankruptcy code to deal when things don't work. We take risks. And when you take risks, you have a chance to actually take a big step. And the aggregation of those four elements tend to result in really strong performance. And so as we look across the world, there's great places to invest all around the world. We're a global investor. Um, but we remain very, very confident in the dollars we put to work in the United States. Jim, what, you, you. and I would add, I would add the other one would be energy competitiveness made a big difference. And and so if you looked at half of all the manufacturing capital that was invested over the last ten years, it was in energy intensive industries. So as you're trying to build back a manufacturing industry in the United States, those investment dollars had gone elsewhere. You had the recipe for success. You had tax cuts in there, and you get yourself on a more competitive basis. And there you go. And then I think to the wage disparity issue. You know, if you look at science, technology, engineering, and math jobs, I don't think it's true that the next generation won't be able to make more than the current generation. But in some other areas, that may be true. In science, technology, engineering, and math, there are great careers and great opportunities out there, and the starting pays are very, very good. We just aren't graduating enough, and we need more. We need to encourage kids more to get into those fields when they're in grade school and get them interested in science. Secretary, uh, the President talked today, um, as others have too, about the importance of deregulation. And one of the things that your administration has done in the first three years has been significant deregulation in areas like energy, labor markets, various other fields like that. What's, what's, what's more to be done on that? What's been achieved there, and how has that changed economic performance? And what's more to be done, in your view? Well, let me just comment before I get to this. I, I do want to just emphasize what you said on energy. I think the fact that the US is now energy independent, that we have an abundance of, of natural gas, cheap energy, um, I, I think is a very big deal. It's a very big deal on a geopolitical basis, but it's also a very big deal on an economic basis. And one of the reasons why we've had low inflation, and I think you'll see very low inflation in, in the near term. Now, on, on deregulation, I mean, let me be clear, we believe in proper regulation. We just don't believe in overregulation. And I think this administration has just a different philosophy that uh, big businesses create small businesses that create jobs. Um, we want to make sure that businesses are regulated properly. But I think, you know, you saw the pendulum swing way too far after the financial crisis. Banking regulation, we got to the point where basically regulators were telling regional bankers how to make loans. Regional bankers know how to make loans. That, that wasn't the problem. Um, I think where there's a lot more work to do is on infrastructure. The president would love to do a trillion dollar infrastructure program. One of the big issues around that is making sure that we can get uh, the permits uh, through the system both at the state and the federal level. So I'd say that uh, energy, uh, pipelines, and infrastructure are big areas where we'll continue to work on deregulation. Let's talk about energy, because obviously, um, as well as being mm -hmm. of significant benefit to the US economy, I don't think anyone would disagree with that over the last few years. There are those, that in addition to the president today, there's a certain 16-year-old schoolgirl wandering around uh, who perhaps will not have the same uh, positive view about uh, policies that result in significant additional um, fracking, um, energy production, uh, car traditional carbon-rich energy production. Is it possible to um, just to, 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 to achieve the kind of gains that the United States has made in energy self-sufficiency, while at the same time at least acknowledging some of the concerns that people have and maybe doing some more to restrain the carbon emissions? Well, I think the U.S. has done a lot. And when you look at the Paris Agreement and you look at the reason why we exited the Paris Agreement was we thought it was an unfair agreement. So there's no question that there are countries, uh, that China is one of them, that have a lot of work to do in terms of environmental issues. India has work to do. There's a lot of countries. 
If you look what the US has done in terms of carbon emissions and the progress we've made independently in the markets, uh, I think, quite frankly, it's very impressive. So I think there's, there's definitely a shift towards clean energy in the US. There's technology that is, is much more abundant for liquid natural gas and clean things. We were talking about before, you know, I, I drove a Tesla when I was able to drive a car in California, and I like the fact that I had an electric car. So people, but nobody talks about, well, how is the electricity generated? And then nobody talks about how are those batteries going to be disposed of and what does it do? So there's no question, you know, we want to have clean air, we want to have clean water. We think there's a way to do it and be energy independent. Jim, I, think to, yeah. I think to Secretary Mnuchin's point, you can do both. You can grow the economy and you can bring the emissions down. We've done that. Um, natural gas was always meant to be a bridge fuel to a future economy, so there's a transition that we were going to go through. I think there's a little bit of an argument of how long will that transition be, how long does it need to be, because storage has to be addressed before we can really get to alternatives that are going to be cost efficient. So if you went today and you made the move completely to alternatives and you said we're going to not do anything with natural gas, you would drive up your electricity costs to the point that you have more wage disparity issues. Electricity demand would go up like we've seen in Germany, 10% increase, but there's no nuclear power. Now I've got to look for alternatives. What am I going to do, burn coal to make that energy? You get yourself into a set of policies that drive you in the wrong direction. And I think what we're trying to do is get ourselves into policies that drive us in the right direction, bring those costs down and manageable. We can still bring CO2 emissions down. It doesn't say we're not going to have a future where alternatives are important. But so far, for big industry, we haven't found an alternative that, that's cost effective. And we've got to work on that. Keita, do you think future economists will think that the US, in rapidly developing and very effectively developing cheap, reliable, and uh, uh, sources of energy that Im dramatically improved US energy self-sufficiency and security, do you think that the, they got the balance, the economists will think we got the balance right between doing that and contributing to the US economic performance in the last 10 or 15 years and meeting the obligations that everybody thinks we have towards addressing the climate challenge? Um. You know, the Secretary is right when he, when he pointed out that one of the reasons why inflation has stayed so low for most of the world, especially advanced economies, is lower energy prices. Uh, and it's also important to point out that despite the recent tensions in the Middle East, there was no big spike in energy prices. And this has to do with new sources of supply. And those, those typically were events that would trigger crises around the world, and that hasn't happened. I mean, but that said, I, I don't think... Uh, one can sit back and wait because in, in terms of what's happening, the consequences of, uh, of climate risks, it's very salient to us at the IMF because we track 189 member countries and there's always several of those who we are downgrading because there was a natural disaster. This was Japan, this is going to happen with Australia. Uh, and so it is, it is an economic, uh, there's real economic cost to it. Uh, you know, regardless of how you feel about what's going to happen as a company, if you are exposed to climate-related risks, that's going to affect your bottom line, just in terms of your financial exposure to it, and you have to be prepared for it. Uh, so I, th I think it's, uh, it's something that countries have to respond to now. I mean, it could happen organically. Uh, it could happen in a much more uh, directed way. I mean, our view is that it should be more directed. There should be more infrastructure spending on climate. There should be more uh, carbon pricing. Uh, but I don't think this is a, a can that can be kicked down the road. Glenn, let's talk about, let's come on to this issue of the resilience of the, of the US expansion. As I said, it's uh, longest expansion in history, ten and a half years old already. Normally, at anything like this stage of an expansion, you're starting to see significant imbalances that typically derail an expansion. Um, you know, rapid wage growth, maybe leading to higher inflation, forcing the Fed to raise interest rates. Maybe there are significant imbalances in the form of financial bubbles. Um, and there are some issues here about valuations and whatever. We don't seem to be seeing any of those kind of problems that you normally associate with a very long institute expansion. So first of all, why not? And secondly, what are the risks? Yeah, I think first, the economy is quite different today than it was 20 years ago. And if we were 20 years ago and we had the manufacturing sector bumping along like it is, um, we might be on the edge of wondering if we were going to slip into a recession. But given the strength of the service economy today um, and the strength of the consumer, 
the U.S. economy is in fine shape. And so we have much bigger um, buoyancy today than we've ever had before. Um, and that allows for a sustainable economy. I think we are not seeing uh, excesses. Um, listen, asset prices are high. When you're in an environment with, with um, you know, 2% growth, and low interest rates kind of around the world, asset prices are naturally going to be high. And we don't see this changing. We see interest rates staying low for the foreseeable future. We see growth um, being modest, although we do think it has a chance to pick back up with, with uh, the recent progress on the trade agreements and with the Brexit resolution. Um, but asset prices are going to stay high. Um, and I think that's a bit of our new reality. And therefore, that is an economic backdrop. I know you're not in the stock market yeah. prediction business, but we saw a remarkable run-up, 30% plus run-up in the S&P 500 in 2019. You're thinking, though, that that can be sustained. You probably don't expect to see another 30%, but you don't see that there's any significant risk of a, of a reversal. Well, the good thing is that what Carlisle gets to do is own businesses for five and 10 years. Um, yeah. And so I don't have to make any annual bets. Um, but I, the short answer is I think the stock market is anticipating exactly what we've been talking about, which is, which is the recovery of global trade and therefore the economic growth that will run underneath it. And I think a lot of that's going to depend on the productivity of the relationship between the US and China. And it seems to be off to a good start. I think it was great that, in fact, the moniker of a currency manipulator was addressed. I think the overtures in China of the receptivity to business and, and the ability to actually invest wholly as opposed to in joint venture all the time is a tremendous step. And so I think the stock market um, ran ahead of the actual economic results in, in, in anticipation of this recovery. Secretary Mnuchin, one imbalance there is that some people have drawn attention to is a remarkably dramatic decline in the fiscal position. Uh, we've seen a trillion dollar uh, deficit for the US in Canada 19. Looks like it's going to be around for a while. 5% of GDP. I think I'm right in saying that, that, that with unemployment at 3.5% after 10 years of growth, we've never seen that level of fiscal deficit. We are normally by this stage, you're building up significant fiscal surpluses. Um, and yet no one seems bothered about it. The bond market certainly doesn't seem bothered about it. We've got 10 year yields still around 180. Most economists don't seem to bother about it. Your rivals in the Democratic Party are planning to do even more and you know, expand the deficit by even more. Have we just stopped worrying about fiscal deficits? Well, uh, let me make two comments on this. First of all, I think you have to look at government debt relative to GDP. I think where we are now is, is, is fine, but I think we have to look at over time what's the rate of growth of government spending. So I, I think as I've mentioned, you know, I'll stay on the record that I think tax cuts will pay for themselves. First two years our projections are right along. Um, but what we also did is we had increased government spending and the president wanted to have more spending on defense. To get that, the Democrats wanted spending on non-defense. So I think there's no question over the next few years, we are going to be, have to be careful in looking at slowing down the rate of growth of, of government spending. So where is, that going to, where is that pressure going to come? Where are you going to look to restrain uh, fiscal, uh, the, the, the public spending growth? Well, again, I think, what areas, I, I think that, I mean, first of all, we've now made a major investment in our military. So I think the rate of growth, we don't need to continue at necessarily the same rate of growth. We can slow down. So I think it's not necessarily cutting. It's basically slowing down the rate of growth of government spending. And what you're going to see, the tax cuts were front end loaded with uh, automatic depreciation and things that incented people to invest now. And you're, so you, I do think you will see revenues begin to pick up. And as I said, we're right on our projections for the first two years. Gita, oh, Jim, I want to come back to you in a second. But Gita, so, uh, so we, we do have a situation then whereby, uh, although things are looking pretty set fair for the US economy, you do have this very unusual situation where you have very little limited monetary room for maneuver. The Fed is already, it's, it's, it's uh, cut rates in the last year, still got 225, 50 basis points that it could, could do more with, but, but limited by historic standards, very, very limited fiscal room for maneuver. Should that be a concern for policymakers that, um, that should there be a downturn, the ability to respond in the traditional ways is significantly attenuated. I mean, so firstly, I would just point out that, uh, relatively speaking here again, I mean, the US central bank certainly has more space than the ECB 
or, or the Bank of Japan. Uh, now, the typical recession in the US has gone along with about a 500 basis point cut, and there's no 500 basis point cut space. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what the, you know, what the evidence seems to suggest is that forward guidance and quantitative easing and these unconventional tools certainly can give you that extra uh, 200 or 300 uh, basis point. But of course, there's a, there's a limit to how much you can go there because at some point these things can have negative effects. Uh, so I just want to uh, flag two things. Uh, I think fiscal policy will have to play an important role if things were to get uh, you know, surprisingly uh, bad. And in this particular area, the US actually, the response on the fiscal side has been slower. So if you look at the global financial crises, US fiscal response took much longer than pretty much all of the G20 countries did. So it might be a, a time to think more of a kind of a cyclical fiscal rule where, a, you know, you have much more automatic uh, spending, which comes through either transfers from the federal to the state level or unemployment insurance or public investment projects that are in the pipeline. So if you can increase the, the, the automatic nature of it, that would certainly help with resilience. I mean, I just want to point to one more thing about resilience. Right now, given the environment, we have a very low uh, interest rates. I think one area uh, that we might pause for concern is what's, ha what's happening with corporate leverage and corporate debt. And we've certainly seen that, that go up a lot. And uh, that is clearly in the purview of the secretary because the FSOC is under you. And so that's actually one area where uh, something can be done in terms of right now there is no regulation for uh, corporate debt. I'm not saying it's not necessarily the regulation or oversight, whichever is the more appropriate word. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing to panic about at this point, but it is something to think of uh, as if it is the case that it's not no, the problem is no longer the, the banking sector, but, but corporate leverage is the problem. I want to come back to corporate leverage, but Jim, I just want to quickly ask you about. Um, potential constraints uh, to continued growth from a manufacturing perspective, but more broadly from a uh, whole economy perspective, and that is the labour market, which uh, we've talked a little bit about. We have historically low unemployment rate, 3.5%. As we said at the beginning, we are see starting to see significant wage growth, that, that, that rising quite significantly. The demographics, uh, again, the United States is in a better position demographically than probably any other major developed country, but they're not great. Uh, immigration um, is, is, is somewhat restrained. The, the sort of organic demographics are not particularly good. How much of a concern? How much of a cons problem do you face yeah. from your perspective with with just a very tight labor market? So if you look at manufacturing today, 25% of the workforce is within five years of being <coughs> retirement eligible, and so there's quite a bit of turnover that's coming. There are a lot of work being done with apprentice programs uh, in our industry, all around the country, local community colleges and apprentice programs to bring veterans back into the workforce are full, and they're graduating with 96, 98% placement rates, very high quality jobs. So we're able to fulfill it. I think the other point I would have raised to Glenn's point about the economy being so different than it is, the digital economy is where it is today. 20 years ago, we couldn't afford to do things that we can do digitally today. And that helps us a lot with productivity. It helps us a lot with advanced manufacturing and automation. That takes a little pressure off of the manufacturing job. Now, it puts pressure on the tech sector, obviously. But I think, all in all, that's a net benefit to the economy. And the more that we invest there, the more important it is. We have to get infrastructure right. That would be a big boon. We're going to have to do that with government and private funds, and if we can do that right and design the infrastructure of the future, 5G for autonomous vehicles, et cetera, th that could really be a step up in investment in the US. That said, I, I want to let Glenn speak too, but, but on the productivity issue, despite the huge investments in uh, information technology over the last 20, 30 years, all the evidence is that productivity, labor productivity, is actually weaker uh, than it's been. That, that continues to be one of the great, um, one of the most striking features of the of the modern U.S. economy. Do you could do you want, could you have a good explanation for that? Do you think there's a measurement issue going on, or do you really think that somehow these gain, these investments are not really translating into any productivity? So I, th I think if you're looking at it at a broad U.S. basis, you could draw that conclusion. But I think if you went down into industries that are investing in new technology and investing in automation you might find differences. You might find other industries are still able to make productivity. Internally, we set targets every year that we want our productivity to pay for wage increases every year. We ought to be able to at least do that. And that means we have to look at investments and other things to make that happen. Mr. Secretary, uh, the labor, the U.S. economy has been a, has been a, a jobs-producing machine for a long time, two, two and a half, two, two and a half million jobs a year. We've said the unemployment rate very low. 
um, uh, how much longer can that go on, given, given the inevitable constraints on labor supply? Well, I, I think there's a lot of things we still need to do. Um, talked about apprenticeship programs, uh, need to make sure there's better education programs for skilled labor. We need to make sure that people who are, are getting advanced PhDs, that we can keep them working at our companies. Um, I do think the participation rate can continue to go higher. I think productivity, we can spend a lot of time talking about why productivity is where it is, but I think there's upside in productivity. And I think, uh, look, the, the president wants to fix immigration. That's, that's part of it. Legal immigration has to ultimately be part of the equation. But I, I would yeah. just add, that there's a million more job openings than there are people willing to take those jobs today mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States. Yeah. And so we're going to figure this out because we have to. Um, and so when you look, at, you look at the opportunity to sell a new product or open a new facility or launch a new service, and if you don't have the right folks to do it, you go find out how to do it. And you partner with the community college, and you come up with a job training program, and you go, you go to um, the, the service alumni fairs. And you literally, business is going to figure this out because we have to. The economy is growing. There's, there's new job opportunities, and we need to fill them. Uh, let's talk about this, uh, if I may, again, come back to you, Secretary, this point that Gita raised about corporate, corporate debt, corporate leverage has, yeah. has dramatically yeah. increased in the last 10 years or so. Um, and she mentioned that, you know, FSOC is your responsibility and um, uh, financial regulation generally. Have you seen anything at all that gives you concern in terms of this significant growth in, in debt? Companies have been buying back a lot of stock, taking on a lot of debt uh, in part in order to do that. Is there anything that gives you any concern there? So this is something that we're monitoring very carefully. And the, the short answer is no. There's nothing that gives us a level of concern, although we'll continue to monitor it. But let me just make a, a couple of comments. First of all, debt in the regulating banking sector is very reasonable. So you know, where you have companies that are borrowing, whether it's covenant light, higher loan to value loans, and things like that, those have moved outside of the banking sector. And, and a lot of those have gone into CLOs and other private equity form, where you have, you have long-term stable capital. Um, so I, I don't think it's an issue. Now, obviously, having high debt in certain industries carries certain risks relative to other industries, but it is something that we are carefully monitoring, and people talk about leveraged lending. And yes, there's more leveraged lending, but we're comfortable that's not in the regulated banking system. And a lot of this borrowing, a lot of this uh, corporate leverage has been on, on, on these sort of so-called covenant lights, uh, borrowing, that kind of stuff. Again, that doesn't, that those, those kind of, uh, when you don't think we're in any danger of seeing the kind of um, financial excesses that we saw that led to the subprime crisis in uh, 2006. I don't. I, th I think that was a very different situation. Again, in the mortgage market, although you've seen some increase in mortgage lending in certain areas, again, you don't have anything like what was clearly, you know, wholesale uh, misunderwriting of, of mortgage credit. Glenn, do you see, and, and the, on the corporate leverage side, do you see anything Yeah, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said and would, would add, listen, there's a prudent level of debt for every company. And responsible owners try to find that level of debt, particularly in our industry. Um, and it has a lot to do with interest rates as well. So as interest rates are low, companies can afford a little bit more debt. And we think interest rates are going to stay low for quite a long time. And we think the debt balances are, are, pretty, are pretty reasonable. I do have to say that as asset prices have gone up, the amount of equity that goes in has increased substantially. And so back when I started my career 25 years ago, Capital structures may have been 25% equity and 75% debt, and it's routinely 50-50 today. Mm. And so the equity cushion that's involved in most capitalizations today um, is substantial, is substantial. Jim, from your perspective, Dan? You know, I think um, on capital intensive industries like ours, the market does a pretty good job of regulating that, and the credit agencies take a good look at that. I can't speak to what's happening in some of the other parts of the market, but in our, in our space, I think we've got pretty good balances in the market already. We've got a few minutes left. I want two, two, two quick rounds, if I may. First is I want to ask all of you what you think the largest risk is. And, Mr. Secretary, you're not allowed to say Bernie Sanders, if I may say so. <laughs> um, but I'll let you see. So you can say Bernie Sanders if you like. Um, the largest risk is to this continued U.S. expansion. So, Glenn, if I may, I'll put you on the spot and start with you. Yeah, I, I think it is, to, it is confidence. And I think as long as... 
there's confidence in uh, a regulatory framework and in policies that we can depend upon um, because um, business is going to be predisposed to assume that that this expansion will die of old age. <laughs> and because economic expansions don't really cease due to anything else. I mean, there's excesses and they don't really die of old age. And so I think that there's going to be a preconceived expectation that eventually it'll have to come to an end and therefore we'll be looking for it. And just like we had earlier this year where there was some concerns um, that, you know, maybe the trade deal wasn't going to get done. And then all of a sudden in September, we see concerns about recession. It was all sentiment driven and not substance driven. And I think that's our biggest, our biggest concern. Do you, on that, do, you, do you think the trade deal, the, the phase one deal with China, the USMCA getting through uh, Congress, we can talk about Bre Brexit getting done, uh, as it were, whatever, whatever comes of that this year. Do you think that has significantly and will improve sentiment uh, in U.S. corporates over the next year. Y yes, but it does. Is that, that fear? Is it gone? The, mm. the fears of a sort of broader trade by no way, by, by no way gone, right. but a substantial step forward. A substantial step forward, but it needs to be followed up with with the next stage of everything. Gisa, one big risk for the for the U.S. economy in the well, next. Well, I mean, years? And then the the way I see it, uh, one reason we've seen the stabilization recently, and in general, I think a bit of the glue that's holding the world together are the easy financial conditions. The low interest rates, countries that are basically not growing, able to borrow at incredibly low rates, and very, short, very small spreads. So a risk I would uh, describe as something that triggers a change in those conditions, not necessarily because the Fed raises <laughs> interest rate, but because there's a huge increase in risk premium. Uh, and you could see that occurring, for instance, if there were a sharp increase in policy uncertainty. We saw that whenever there was uncertainty on the trade policy front, we saw markets moving around very quickly. So if you take a combination of incredible uncertainty on the policy front, you know, in the Middle East, geopolitical risks, social unrest, I mean, these kinds of issues uh, could be a trigger that suddenly now the market overreacts or overreacts uh, and financial conditions tighten. And then this, this kind of nice, happy balance we are in uh, gets lost. Mr. Secretary, I mean, you don't want to put it probably in terms <laughs> yeah, of negative yeah. risks and other than Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Pete Buttigieg and Joe Biden and maybe Mike Bloomberg, what, uh, what, is, what keeps you awake at night? What, 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 are you, what are the things that you're very much focused on right well, now? Well, the good thing is I sleep pretty well at night. But uh, <laughs> I, I will say, and you gave the answer, I won't pick which one, but I think political risk is the biggest risk to the U.S. economy. You have two very different visions <clears throat> uh, for the way the economy will be managed and business opportunities. So, you know, there, there are some very extreme socialist type of economic programs. Uh, you're talking, you know, you got some of the candidates, I won't say which one, that want to regulate the top 100 U.S. corporations and set up a new agency in the government to do that. There's no question, you know, you'd see very different views of banking regulation. So I do think in the U.S. it's, uh, there is, you know, two very different views of politics that will change economic outlooks dramatically. Jim, for you. Access to global markets and making sure that we build back our ally relationships around the world. Uh, the U.S. needs global markets to be able to export goods and services and technology. And uh, I think part of the biggest um, uh, kudos to Secretary Mnuchin on the China deal phase one was access to the financial markets. Thank access you. to those markets is very important for us. It's not just our industry. Uh, on a free and a fair basis. Yeah. Final question for all of you very quickly. Uh, Glenn, um, you noted that you know, expansions don't die of old age. The US expansion is more than 10 years old. Let me ask each of you very quickly, what are the, what are the, what are the odds? We, what, are we, what, what are the chances that we come, we're, still, we're here in 2025? And this expansion is still going. Yeah, you know, absent some material geopolitical issue, and I, I think, which we don't expect to happen, um, I think that we will still be in a period of low growth, low interest rates, and high asset prices in five years. Lisa? I mean, we, like I mentioned, we have a projection for maybe five years from now, which is a one and three quarters percent. That's where we think. But you never forecast a recession, do you, to be fair? I mean, they are, by their nature, well, you know, times are changing. There's a new chief economist. Who knows? <laughs> oh, well, that's interesting. Isn't it? <laughs> Things can happen, but uh, but yeah, I mean, that's where we see it. But of course, I think there are many risks, and I would say policy uncertainty is a big one. I mean, including related to uh, what happens in the next 12 months in the U.S.
Secretary? I'd, I'd say especially the next two to three years where I think we have very good visibility into the, the economy and also certain global issues. I think we feel very strong about the economy. I think the corporate debt is high because there was a lot of investment made in manufacturing. And so the next couple of years, even if we have low, slow growth, it's going to absorb that capacity. And I think we're going to see an expansion over this next five years. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, economics is supposed to be the dismal science, but I think we've left you all extremely uplifted by the prospects for the U.S. economy <laughs> with... Uh, admittedly, some uh, risks that we all see, but I think the general um, uh, belief is that the causes and the roots of this uh, US expansion are pretty solid, and that, uh, as far as we can see, especially with improving international climate, perhaps for trade uh, and international economics, then the expansion prospects remain pretty good. So please join me in thanking our really very distinguished panel. Thank you. Well done. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you.